Welcome. I think this is an impressive sized crowd for a chilly gray day. Maybe the sun will continue try to come out. Um, as always, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, one of my least favorite things is coming up with topics for these tours, partly because I, I don't tell Chris I haven't yet come up with topics for the rest of the year, but because, um, you know, I always feel you can walk through the Arboretum and the Arboretum's going to tell its story, but, you know, the topic I chose for today is magnolias, but also anything else of interest as we go through the garden. and. Uh, as far as magnolias, we'll focus on the ones that are in bloom, maybe mention a few that aren't in bloom, but you know, there's plenty to see. Today's the last good day to see them because tomorrow morning they will be exhibiting their more normal flower color of brown. Um, and why is that? Why is that? Because it's going down to about 22 tonight. Um, the open flowers will be destroyed by those temperatures. Um, what's that? Oh, yeah. Yes, we yes, that? sure, of course, yeah, <laughs> and, and you'll need, you know, a 60-foot ladder to climb up yeah. and pick, well, pick all of them. Yeah. you can't walk in the compost now. Right. So yeah. All right, well, um, we'll get started. Um, well, I always like to know the derivation of words, thanks to a middle school English teacher, and the genus Magnolia is actually named for a French botanist, Pierre Magnol, M-A-G-N-O-L. So magnolia is not really a Latin word, it's taken from a, a person's family name. We'll continue just to the end of the parking lot. Um, there's a tremendous amount of breeding going on with magnolias um, at this time. Um, breeding magnolias is nothing new. The old saucer magnolias were first developed in the 18th century. Um, but And one thing people are breeding for is lateness. So on the corner of the building there is a magnolia that's not in bloom at all. It's one called Coral Lake, and it's a late blooming. And late blooming can be a, an advantage with magnolias because they're more likely to avoid these frosts that we always have at this time of the year. Um, Coral Lake o o also um, is an example of another line of breeding, bre breeding for sort of warm pinks. Most um, pink magnolias are sort of purple pinks Flox pinks, but uh, Coral Lake is really a, a warm sort of shrimp pink. It's a lovely thing later on. We're going to continue this way and go through Asian Valley up through the Japanese garden. Chinese sassafras, and um, I don't know if the flowers will be hurt by the cold, but it's certainly worth pointing out. Um, I think it's really quite showy in bloom. Oh, it's yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, and this is a young tree. Um, the Chinese sassafras, there's two species of um, sassafras in Asia, in China, and it doesn't form a colony like our native one. It becomes a large single trunk tree. I saw it in China with trunk about like this big, and the bark was real uh, red-brown and shreddy. I thought I was looking at a conifer. That it was much more like a, you know, a, a camisipper's trunk or something like that. How big will it get? Um, it's a big, it's a big tree. Um, I don't remember what I read, but you know, it's more the size of a, you know, sugar maple or, uh, or uh, one of our oaks or something like that. It's a full-size tree. Well, I'm pointing out this magnolia. Of course, I don't hardly need to point it out. That's a hybrid called um, Galaxy. Um, there are a number of very choice hybrids that have Magnolia um, Sprangeri Diva as a parent. Um, and this is one. Um, Vulcan is another. And um, oh, I'm forgetting the third. Anyhow, lovely color. Great big tree. <laughs> another line of breeding of, of magnolias nowadays is to breed for smaller plants that mature at a smaller size. You saw how big um, mm -hmm. Galaxy was out there. Um, this is a compact selection of Magnolia lilliflora um, called Mini Mouse. Um, and I don't know how, I don't know if we have the accession number. Yeah, this was from 2013. I don't know what size it was then, but so it's been 
you know, we've been growing it for six years. Um, Do you know how tall the thing? No, I don't, but it, it's clearly quite compact because little flora normally grows quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Magnolia little flora is one of the smaller growing magnolias. Um, it's very shrubby in that it makes mm -hmm. many, many, many stems. It's also the source of purple in a lot of the hybrids, like the, the uh, saucer magnolias, the tulip trees, that mm -hmm. is what we grew up calling them, are hybrids between magnolia lilliflora and magnolia denudata. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't, I, our denudata might be done blooming by now, but denudata has that lovely mm -hmm. goblet shaped flower, it's, but it's, the typical color is white. And so you cross it with this purple one and you come up with the typical sort of purple pink um, Magnolia Sulangiana. And I said that my, my, the genus Magnolia was named for a Frenchman with the family name of Magnol, but Sulangiana sounds very French too because it's named after Soulange. Not, I don't know who Soulange was, but that's a 19th century hybrid. Um, so is that tulip, what we call tulip trees is Magnolia Solangiana? Well, I don't know what you call tulip trees. That's <laughs> the problem with common names. <laughs> um, um, you know, because people also called um, Liriodendron tulip trees. Yeah. The tulip poplar is what I tend to call it. Oh, to oh right, of course. Yeah. 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 Um, is this um, available in the trade, do you know? This cultivar? Yes. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. But yeah, nowadays it's so easy to look yeah. it up. You could look it up right now on your phone. Um, Where's she's she? turning? No, no, but um, <laughs> the um, please, oh. <laughs> uh, you know it. You're not going to find it in the garden center, I don't think. But from a mail order nursery, mail order. probably. You know, mm -hmm. so many things are available that okay. way. Okay. Um, and one of the um, as far as the uh, deciduous magnolias, the ones that are um, most readily available are the girls. There's eight of them, you know, Betty, Jane, um, Pinky. Um, I've never seen Pinky. Um, well, there, no, it's a whole, there's eight mm. different magnolias with uh, that are... Are they shrubby? Well, this is one of their parents, so that, yes, they oh. have this shrubby habit. Oh, okay. Um, they're often confused with saucer magnolias, magnolia sulangiana, because they look sort of like it, but they tend to be more a narrow rather than a broad mm -hmm. goblet. Um, and their other parent is star magnolia. Okay, and yeah. they, uh, I was amazed, when, oh, I've destroyed this flower. Um, I was amazed to read that they were originally introduced in 1955 and 56 because they seem you know, like something that's only been around for about 30 mm -hmm. years, not, uh, you know, 60 some years. Um, but that's the nature of things, you know, it takes a long time to develop them, it takes a long time to, you know, build up nursery stock and make them available. But um, th it was the National Arboretum that introduced them and they were breeding, what they were hoping for is to breed something that would bloom later than star magnolia. Now, I grew up in northern New Jersey near New York City, and we had a star magnolia in the yard, and it generally got frosted, um, or I should say, it generally caused frost just like they do down here. <laughs> but up there, by the time the saucer magnolias bloomed, in, in my, you know, 20 some years growing up in that area, I never saw a saucer magnolias get frosted, but here mm. that's just as common um, as it is for um, star magnolias to get mm -hmm. frosted. So they were trying to get magnolias that bloom later. So um, yeah. you know, what's your favorite? The girls. Well, I'm I'm never sure of the name. There's one that's sort of the darkest uh, purple, close closer to violet, mm -hmm. and um, I don't remember its name. Mm. And there, this one you always see in the trade around here. Jane? Oh, you do? I think Jane. Jane's the most popular. Jane and Betty. Like, you know, when I was reading, I didn't realize there were eight of them because, like, I'm, I've never heard of Pinky until I read that list of them. Mm. And there were a couple. Randy. I, I've never um, I've never encountered Randy. You know, nurseries pick up maybe the better ones and, um, you know, and the other ones never make it big time. Um, now, a whole different 
um, group of magnolias are these evergreen ones from China. Now we'll make sure when we leave the lath house that we go out on the lawn for them. a little distance and turn around mm, and great. look at this because this looks totally unimpressive from here but it's spectacular from out there. Yeah, I bet. And, oh, um, just up in here, all the flowers. Um, it's, it's Magnolia Maudie, named for somebody named Maud. Mm. Um, and not too many years ago, they were not in the genus Magnolia, they were in the genus Michelia. And mm. depending on which authority you're referring to, there were either 17 uh, genera in the fam Magnolia family, or there's two. <laughs> um, now, the one constant in that is the tulip poplars, the Liriodendron, our, our native yellow poplar tree. Um, that genus tends not to get lumped with the magnolias, but all the other genera, the Michelia, um, Mangletia, Paracmaria, um, you know, those other, let's say, 17, 15 genera, all of those are now lumped into one genus, Magnolia. And that was based on DNA research. Before DNA research, plants were classified, classified by morphology. Well, morphology doesn't always reflect their genetics. And, and so genetics, I guess, are a little bit more definitive than, um, you know, actual, just the morphology. But if you look at a flower, like the, the only Michelia that's been in common in gardens for a long time in the U.S. is the banana shrub. Everybody mm -hmm. know the banana shrub? It's mm -hmm. an old it's plant. A mm -hmm. It's a magnolia now. Yeah, it used to be Michelia figo, F-I-G-O. Um, it's now, um, well, magnolia figo. And, but if you look at that oh. flower, it, it ha has the same floral parts inside of, of a magnolia. Um, and if you don't know banana shrub, it gets its name because when it blooms, you know, 50 like feet away, you start smelling, you know, this banana. It's, to my, my nose, it's more like those orange marshmallow circus peanuts that are <laughs> banana flavored <laughs> rather than, a, you know, a true, true banana flavor. But there are a bunch of these evergreen white flowered magnolias um, that are very similar. This big tree here, I'm sure its canopy is thin because winter of last year when we, uh, I don't remember how low we got, but that was really hard on a lot of, what? Louder? Well, it'd also help if I turn around. And, um, <laughs> but I'm sure its canopy is thin from that cold weather cold we weather. had last yeah. year. Um, and we'll, we'll see some other better examples as we leave. Well, if, if you'll enter the, um, well, actually, I'll meet you right over by the entrance to the lath house, but we won't go in the lath house just yet. Some of these um, evergreen magnolias uh, are already done blooming. This one bloomed maybe six weeks ago, and I'm not remembering. Somebody want to read its label there? Is it? Oh yeah, Magnolia cavalieri. Um, and you notice some dead stems on it. It was completely defoliated by last year's cold. A lot of these evergreen magnolias are probably more reliable in a zone eight. We're a warm zone seven, so you know a lot of winters will get by with them. But you know they're on the ed some of them are on the edge. Chris, I don't remember ever seeing this Magnolia lotongensis bloom. I don't know. Yeah, but I, I love the tree for its its uh, outline, its narrowly conical growth habit. Um, we'll, we'll look at that one too from um, outside the Arboretum where you have, a, uh, um, outside the Lath House where you have a better view of it. When you enter the um, Lath House, take that first right and we'll go down and see a non-Magnolia. Um, I was carrying that flower earlier. It was actually a flower off of not this exact plant, but the same, you know, genus. This is actually a witch hazel relative. I have trouble understanding how that can be, but it's a very beautiful thing. But it always starts blooming about this time of year, so generally the flowers get hurt by the frost. It's um, Rhodolia, Rhodolia henryi. Anybody want to guess what Henry I is referring to? Someone named Henry. 
see those those scientific names aren't that scary <laughs> um, we can't overlook the uh, lilac Daphne um, Daphne Genkwa not at all fragrant so um, even though I know t um, Chris is using the scratch and sniff film on on the recorder um, you won't get any fragrance out of this one uh, let's see but if you look up now, you can start to see all the flowers on this oh, Magnolia yeah. Maudier. And it's, it's first started blooming when this big Magnolia Cavalieri first started. And then we had a couple days of cold and those open flowers got hurt. And now it's been out in full bloom <coughs> three weeks or more. Didn't, yeah, it's been in bloom for a long time. Yeah, you can see oh, it. Oh, yeah. There. Yeah, um, you know, one thing I'm meant to do was, I, I wondered the other day how many species of stachyoris that there are. I think this is just a selection of prey cocks. Yeah, it's a subspecies of prey cocks, but the one around the corner, I, let's go take a look at it because it's a somewhat tender variety that we, might not bloom well every year. That's also semi-evergreen. This is um, Stachyurus, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it right, Sigiyosii, S-I-G-E-Y-O-S-I-I. Um, what family are they? Well, I was wondering what family they're in. They're in the Stachyuriaceae. Hmm. <laughs> so, uh, not very helpful. St st Stachyurus is not the prettiest word in the world. Uh, Stacky is referring to spikes, and they are pendant spikes of flowers. One thing that's interesting is how stiff they are. You know, the, the whole thing moves. It doesn't, you know, bend a whole lot. But I really like them. They're great woodland shrubs. Um, we have a number of different cultivars of Stachyurus praecox. That's the one most common in the nursery trade. We also have Stachyurus Himalayaca, which is real pretty. There's several nice ones in uh, the winter garden. Yeah, there, there's a fair amount of fragrance to that, even on a chilly day. There's a, a species of magnolia, you know, used to be Michele, Michelia alba, that is, you know, popular in warm parts of Southeast Asia that's used for, um, you know, take offerings in a temple if you'll take it and pass it around but this is a magnolia eternal spring it was um, bred by dr clifford parks of camellia forest in chapel hill um, i don't know if there's currently a, a source for the plant and a lot of these um, magnolias are hard to root so a lot of them are uh, propagated by grafting them yes so since they're blooming in the winter what's pollinating on a warm day, the honeybees will be out. And that's about it? I mean, because a lot of people don't have honeybees anymore. So what's... Um, well, um, you know, your question is more based on uh, a much longer historical time frame than, than the last couple years. Um, and these are of Asian origin, and honeybees are native to the old world, so probably would be their... Uh, a common pollinator but another thing to remember is that magnolias are some of the oldest of the flowering plants and when flowering plants first evolved there weren't honeybees because there wasn't any reason to be a flower pollinating bee if because there weren't any flowers to pollinate so the earliest flowers were generally pollinated by insects that already existed like flies and beetles um, and often in the summertime, if you look inside a Magnolia grandiflora flower, you'll see beetles, or a beetle. Is this a big, more hardy variety perhaps? I don't know. I don't know. And I, I, I meant to look up its parentage. It's a primary hybrid between two species, but I don't know. You know, a Magnolia figo, the um, banana shrub, 
is more hardy than most of the other evergreen magnolias. So if that was one of the parents, it, maybe it would be more cold hardy than like the ones we saw inside that suffered last winter. Marilyn, you had a question? Smaller. What? I think this might stay a little smaller. I, I just don't know. I just don't know. No, I, I don't know. I need to do a little bit more research. Maybe I'll mention in the next e-newsletter, um, you know, what information I found out on it. Was it grafted? Can you tell? It doesn't look like it was grafted. I don't, it do, I don't see a clear graft union down there. So it might be one that roots are, you know, the things that are difficult to root that are commercially grafted, you still could get a low percentage to root in the, you know. All right. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I, a couple weeks ago, read up on it and it mentioned its two parents, but I don't remember who they are. Um, this is a hybrid magnolia, magnolia ex lobneri. The cultivar is Merle. Um, Magnolia cobus and Magnolia stellata are two very closely related species. Um, I don't know a common name for Magnolia cobus. Stellata meaning star is the star Magnolia that everybody knows. Um, and at one point I thought they had been lumped together, in which case then this wouldn't be a hybrid Magnolia. But what I double checked today and apparently Magnolia stellata and cobus are being treated as separate species. Um, cobus is a much bigger grower than stellata, and I guess that's where Dr. Or Merrill is getting its great size. I think one of the most important things to find out about a plant when you buy it is how big does it get. Um, and you know, they look so innocent in a little three gallon pot, um, but I never would have guessed, um, it, you know, essentially hybrid star mag magnolia would get this big. This is magnolia cylindrica. I don't know why it's cylindrica. I don't know. Flowers are sort of cylindrical. I don't know what the fruit looks like. Um, I think a lot of the uh, deciduous, deciduous magnolias are real handsome in the winter time. The, the bark is sort of silvery. The buds are often real fuzzy. This one has super fuzzy buds. I'm gonna, I'll pass it around so you can uh, see it. Its common name is um, Yellow Mountain um, Magnolia. I don't remember. I don't remember if I said it was a Chinese species. Um, pretty fuchsia purple markings at the base of the petal. Let me see. I know one thing. I read it has nine tepals. Does everyone know the term tepal? No. Okay. Um, in some plants, well, in, in, in a lot of plants, you have sepals, and then uh, you ha and then you have petals. Sepals are usually more leaf-like, and are usually what covers the flower before it opens up. But in a, um, some plants, like magnolias and camellias, the, um, it's not really. Uh, there's no distinction between sepals and petals, so in those situations the term tepal is used, T-E-P-A-L. Um, and, you know, if you look at a, maybe we'll grab a camellia flower at some point. You have things on the outermost uh, whorl of um, petals that are look like sepals, but then, then you get some that are sort of half green and half petal-like. And so there's this continuous gradation from one to the other. So the, that's why the, we have this alternate um, thing. Now, one thing that disting, distinguishes um, magnolias from many um, um, more recently evolved flowers is that the floral parts are in a spiral. Whereas in, you know, you think of like a, a amaryllis or a tulip, they're in a whorl. You have a whorl of sepals, and you have a whorl of petals, and you have a whorl of stamens. But these are in a spiral arrangement. Anybody want, who, who was going to collect all the open flowers? I have a start now. Doug, um, okay. yeah. if you had to pick one magnolia that's going to do okay through this hard phase, 
have a choice? Just um, the ones that have no production, I guess. Well, the, the question was what magnolia would I choose if I could choose just one magnolia that would make it through this hard freeze? A one that, a late blooming one. Yeah, a late blooming one. Um, all of these earlier ones, more years than not, get frosted while they're in full bloom. You know, that's why I've said for years they cause frost. Um, it's like, oh, star magnolia is blooming. I better protect things. That means we're going to have a frost soon. Um, you know, I'm being sarcastic, but, um, you know, it seems that way. Yeah, so if, what? No, they just, they start... It, it's not a it's not a matter of winter hardiness. It's a matter that they start blooming when the weather is still very changeable. Um, they they come up they open. Um, I'm not a plant physiologist, but they open. You know, it doesn't take much warm weather to encourage them to open. And but they're opening early enough that the we our weather. You know, the late garden writer Bill Hunt from Chapel Hill said. And he was probably stole this from somebody else that the only thing consistent about our weather are the inconsistencies you know we have spring and then we have winter again and we have spring and then we have winter again and on and on we go yeah And it, 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 well, yeah, that, that could make sense. And it might also be that, you know, plants from cold climates need a certain amount of cold before they will break dormancy. You know, you always hear, oh, the winter hasn't been cold enough for apple trees to bloom really well. Well, they have a certain number of hours, they're calling chill, chill hours or something like that. Um, they have to have so many hours below 40. Um, and so something like magnolia flower buds, I imagine, have a very low chilling requirement. And so very by January, they've already had enough cold, so they're ready to open the first warm spell. And I've wondered if, you know, all of these deciduous magnolias are of Asian origin. Um, our native um, North American magnolias are all summer blooming. And so, you know, maybe maybe spring comes differently in China than it does here. You know, maybe maybe they don't have this up and down and up and down. You know, my boss Mark Wethington probably knows. He's been to China a bunch of times. He probably has a good sense of if spring is different in China than it is here. Uh, so, yes. I w wondered if if you know if magnolias are triggered to bloom based on that number of chill hours or maybe on the day length. Of sunlight, does that have anything to do with it? Um, because if if up north, if they wait to bloom when all that stuff is passed, I'm thinking it can't just be chill hours, or they'd be blooming up there the same earlier than they bloom down. Oh, here. that's a good point, but but you can also be you can also ago. be uh cold enough to keep that that would keep them from opening. It's complex, I don't know. Yeah, yeah two is. years ago, you know, all the magnolias were blooming. And when? November? No, I don't. Yeah. Like they all came out in the fall because it stayed so warm. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Well, and last year was. I don't know, um, Chris, am I mad? Did you remember that? Well, the, the ones next to the arboretum in that the commercial yeah, complex, they flower almost every fall. Yeah. Oh, the ones along the street? Yeah. Yeah, they often do. And, and like the, the hybrid ones that I referred to earlier, the little girls, often you'll see a. a uh, you know, Spattered. sputtering of flowers through the summer into the fall. Mm -hmm. Never, you know, a full flush, but, um, I, you know, the occasional flower through the summer month. Mm -hmm. Since since a camellia was at hand and when I was talking about the term teeple, um, I mentioned camellia, so I thought I would show you. Um, this is a lovely one. This is, flower hasn't opened all the way yet, one called Jacks, J-A-C-K-S. Um, our plant is in a little bit too much hot sun in the summer, but it's normally a really beautiful foliage plant too. But, you know, you have these outer teeples that are fully green, so, you know, you could say that, yeah, these are definitely, um, I don't know if everybody can see this. We got our 
work kink out in my shoulder. You know, a lot of these are fully green, so it'd be easy to call them sepals. But then you get to a point where you have ones like this that are, you know, half green and half pink like the rest of the flower. Um, there's sev several like that. And so there's not a really clean uh, break between sepals and petals, but one grades into the other. And in that kind of situation, we call them tepals. And actually, when I was talking about that earlier, I was saying uh, tulips. Well, tulips are in a good example because you had three sepals and three petals. So you have six things that look like petals. So in that situation, we would use the term tepal too. What's but, their purpose? Pur purpose What's to their what? purpose for? Do they surround the bud when it's first starting to come out? It keeps um, it warm or it must have a reason for existing. Well, yeah, those those outer ones that are um, most thing. like a sepal are, are these outer layers here yeah. that are, are the covering the bud. So, yeah, like a the outer ones are definitely behaving like a typical sepal. You know what we're going to have to do is find a flower that has that. Di well, that forsythia might be a good example. Yeah, because the point isn't that these sepals aren't behaving like sepals and the petals aren't behaving like petals. The point is that there's a, they one grades into the other, and that's what when they use the term tepal, when you know there are these intermediate ones that aren't fully sepal or not fully petals so it's just a botanical term mm -hmm. and you know you can forget it and never think about it the rest of your life it, <laughs> um, and pr I've probably spent too much time on it um, the forsythia has four petals and four sepals um, I'll pass it around or pick a bunch and pass it around you can see they're you know distinctly different there's four little green sepals all of one size and then the four big yellow petals all of the same size um, so they're um, you know they are distinctly sepals and petals they're not you wouldn't use the term tepal a lot of people don't know uh, the distinction between botany and horticulture <laughs> um, you know people have often said to me um, you know, oh, you know so much about plants, you must be a botanist. Well, I'm not a botanist, I'm a horticulturist. Uh, well, botany is a pure science, like geology and zoology, and horticulture is a combination of science, craft, and art, and it draws from many sciences, and most importantly, probably from botany. So, you know, all this terminology is um, botanical, but of course, it's it's also, you know, the foundation of the language we use as gardeners. Foliage. I mentioned that nowadays the magnolia family is thought to consist of only two genera. Genera being the plural of genus, not geniuses. Um, and the two genera are magnolia and liriodendron. This is tulip poplar or yellow poplar. Uh, Liriodendron, and this is actually, is this the hybrid? This is the Chinese one. Oh, yeah, this is, oh, yeah, this is the Chinese Chinese one named for uh, J.C. Ralston. And, you know, I think one thing that really distinguishes the Liriodendron from Magnolia is the fruit, or, you know, the f fruit of a Magnolia is fleshy, and it opens up and has those orange-colored seeds inside, and this is more like the little winged seed heads of a um, magnolia, but it arranged more in like a cone-like structure. Here are um, three more species of white-flowered evergreen Chinese magnolias. Um, I hope my boss doesn't see this. I'll probably get fired for saying this, but they, to my eye, they're more alike than different. <laughs> um, I can see the differences, especially when I, you know, hold branches up close. And one of them currently isn't blooming. See the one with a whole lot of flowers immediately to the right? You see sort of a tight, narrow tree. That's a... Um, I don't remember whether that one is done blooming or, um, or hasn't yet bloomed. 
I'm happy to walk over there and grab some names and stuff if anybody wants to know names of them. Yes, Marilyn? The one that's bonding, I think, is called Smiling Forest. Um, that, is that its common name or cultivar name? I think. the cultivar name, it's a, I think. Yeah, well, I'll check. It, but it was I have my holly-proof coat on. I don't know. I thought they were getting rid of it. Is the camera on? I know the I know the other side better. Photo bomb. Photo bomb. <laughs> it's showing top of the camera. <laughs> um, the one in bloom is actually Maudier, which is that same one we saw up above the lap house. But now you get a chance to smell it. And these are seed grown um, plants, so they're very some. I think this is maybe a little bit more spidery than the one in the lap house. And um, a lot of these magnolias have these wonderful fuzzy brown buds. And this one's label is missing, and that's my fault. Um, <laughs> Last year when, um, last July actually, we had electrical lines run so we could have some permanent light electrical lines out here for moonlight. Um, and I, they cut an irrigation line so we ended up with a big hole in the ground next to those magnolias. So I took the label inside for safekeeping and failed to bring it back out. And this one here, I, I couldn't reach any flowers, but that's some um, Magnolia uh, Cavalierii, variety Platypetali. If you'll pass that around, I think you'll enjoy the fragrance. Well, and go enjoy the fuzzy buds on that guy. I probably should hold those up for Chris to see. What's that big magnolia right there? I don't remember. You don't need to Oh, that's too close. No, don't go I, I need to zoom in on it. I, I go back out the video. The big um, deciduous magnolia is a hybrid called yellow fever. Um, the yellow pigment in at least most of the hybrids is from our native cucumber magnolia, magnolia uh, acuminata. Um, it's called cucumber tree because the fruit looks sort of like a little gherkin pickle. Um, and it's a the Magnolia cuminata becomes a great big forest tree. There was one at Montrose and Hillsboro that um, was probably planted in the mid 1800s when a lot of the old trees were planted there. And when that tree fell over, the trunk laying on the ground was about this high. It was, you know, about four feet in diameter. Um, the flowers on uh, Magnolia cuminata are produced at the same time it's putting out foliage and they're sort of a, more of a green than a yellow um, and so they're not really showy but as a parent it imparts that yellow pigment into um, um, a lot of the hybrids and it usually blooms out pretty well because it's late blooming there's a, another yellow hybrid almost directly across from here that you can sort of see it's starting and that might be yellow bird um, and it's a pretty good yellow too. A lot of the um, yellow hybrids get really big since they have Magnolia uh, cuminata as the parent. The big purple one ahead is the same as the one we saw in Asian Valley um, Galaxy, but there are a lot of older Magnolias down here to see. In this 
older part of the Arboretum, there are a lot of um, saucer magnolias and star magnolias and similar hybrids. This is a, a saucer magnolia, Coates, um, C-O-A-T-E-S. I love it. Um, a lot of these wouldn't grow so tall and scrawny like this if they were grown out in the open. They would tend to branch out low. And um, I, I think that would be the growth habit I would prefer because you could enjoy the flowers more at eye level than strictly overhead. But um, this is a really good day to see them because tomorrow they won't be pretty anymore. <laughs> this selection of star magnolias is um, scented silver. It's a fairly typical looking star magnolia flower. I, I got a little bit of scent out of it, but you all are welcome to stick your nose in it. Yeah, the, 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 all these deciduous magnolias, um, the ones we're seeing today, bloom before the foliage is produced. Um, the flower buds and the vegetative buds are separate, um, so they open independent of them. Um, like, well, they're starting to leaf out a bit. Yeah, they're starting to leaf out. These tiny leaves will probably be hurt by tonight's cold as well. What? I, I would think so. They're so tender. I'll have to check tomorrow. You know, beauty is in the eye of beholder or whatever, but what I love best in the saucer magnolias are when the, they're these big round goblets of flowers. Up above here we see another magnolia with sort of twisted narrow petals. I don't think it's quite as beautiful as this. And this is coming from the Magnolia denudata parent, the Yulon magnolia. And we still have a few flowers on our Yulon over here. Um, the U Yulon magnolia in the wild is pretty much always white, but this is a pink selection called Forest Pink, I believe. And last year it bloomed before we had that month-long cold spell when the magnolias bloomed from beginning to end because it was never too cold. Uh, but this bloomed before them when it was warm. They were opening up one day, full day on, full open on the second day, and the third day they were falling apart. Mm -hmm. So temperature has a huge impact on the, how long these things last. Um, I was wrong earlier. I told you this was yellow bird. It's a gold finch. Um, it does bloom early enough that quite a few years it gets clobbered. Um, there are later blooming yellow ones. You probably could see it from here if it was in bloom, but it's still in tight bud. It's sort of straight out that way. Um, one called Lois that I like quite a bit. It's fairly yellow and it's a lovely, shapely, late blooming thing. Um, but this is lovely too when when it manages to bloom. Um, yes, and Elizabeth was the first hybrid, um, Lord, first yellow flowered hybrid. Um, it was developed by the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Um, some of those hybrids are referred to as Magnolia ex Brooklynensis. Um, Elizabeth is quite lovely. Um, in my experience, it opens up about as yellow as this net is now, but quickly turns closer to white. So the more common effect is sort of cream colored. This is a selection of Magnolia cobis. Cobis is the species that I said was really closely related to Magnolia stellata, the star magnolia. And this one is falling apart as I hold it. Um, it's notable because it's fairly columnar, but then again, like so many columnar plants that are tightly columnar when they're young, they soon suffer from middle age spread. So um, I don't think this is going to be all that columnar in, in years to come, but um, you know, it could potentially be a good parent for breeding more compact mag magnolias. The flower is pitiful, um, but time will tell. Um, 
Um, this is another evergreen white flowered magnolia from China. It's Magnolia Lavifolia and has, um, you know, these really handsome, what color is that, sort of coppery brown uh, fuzzy buds. Um, I don't like the growth habit or the foliage all that much, but it's really pretty in bloom. The flowers are about almost two inches across these um, white cups, and it, it'll just be covered in white flowers for a couple of uh, two, three weeks or so. So if you're here a month from now, you know, come and check these out. This is the cultivar Snowbird. We have a num number of other selections of this species. Um, what? Lavifolia. Um, well, there's a. I absentmindedly picked off this flower that was starting to open, so it's going to slow down with the cold. But you know, a month from now it'll be in full bloom. The plant? Yes. Um, I I don't really know. I don't think it's going to be. A giant like some of the big evergreen ones we saw um, it sort of grows up and then hangs down um, but I don't know what its ultimate height is the question is will deer eat this um, I haven't grown these evergreen ones um, in deer uh, filled gardens, but a number of the people I gardened for in the past who had a lot of deer, the deer didn't browse magnolias as much as um, the bucks rubbing their antlers on them. Um, yeah, I've got one. Marilyn, do, do they? Do, do your deer eat them? Maybe I have so much else to watch the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, Same with me. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, you know, I always hate to say that uh, deer don't eat something because you know they 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 bug us and you know they they know that that we just said this so that they go out and they'll eat what tonight. we just yeah they'll be out there tonight. <laughs> um, so, but those with the experienced um, seem to feel that this is fairly deer resistant. Um, in the garden where the deer often, uh, where the bucks often rack the shrubs, what we did, we got a large number of four feet, four foot long um, pieces of rebar and just put enough around the trunk so they wouldn't rack the trunk. Um, because they, in that garden, they, they didn't uh, graze on the magnolias to any appreciable extent, but they can, you know, destroy whole trunks of them overnight. Um, so this plant would get a fair amount of sunshine here yeah. in the summertime. Would it thrive in an area where it gets less summer sunshine once trees put out around it? The question was how much, you know, would this perform well in shade? Um, I, I don't really know the answer to the question. Um, I suspect, you know, if it's a very bright shade, they probably do all right. Um, you know, probably in the wild you would see this growing under trees, but that doesn't indicate that that's where it wants to be. It just means that it doesn't know how to operate a chainsaw. Um, but, you know, probably more sun, more flowers, but it might still get, give a decent display. You know who might know would be um, David Parks from Camellia Forest. Mm -hmm. His father gardens under pine trees, large garden in Chapel Hill, and he, you know, so he's growing most things in, in under the bright shade of pine trees. With deer? No, he has a deer fence. Okay. Yeah, but people tend to think that this is not the first thing the deer are going to uh, eat. Mm -hmm. Walk past my favorite magnolia. <laughs> this is um, Southeast U.S. native magnolia macrophylla. Macrophylla meaning big leaf, and the leaves are big. Um, 
Some are blooming. The flowers are a lot like the big white flowers, the Magnolia Grand of uh, Flora. Um, but this great big candelabra in the winter with the big uh, sort of silvery buds. It's one of my favorite plants. It's just such a wonderful look, looking thing. Largest simple, simple leaf of any of our native trees. The plant with the largest compound leaf is Kentucky coffee tree. Do you see it just grown in the wild like around here? Don't you? I mean, no. No? Um, I, I saw a patch of something. Okay. Um, there are three or four species of big, big leaf magnolias native to the southeast. The one that is more common is Magnolia acuminate, no, Magnolia tripetala. Um, they're pretty easy to distinguish. Um, Macrophylla has these fuzzy silvery buds. Um, tripetala buds are smooth and brown this time of year. And um, Magnolia macrophylla leaves, we're not going to find one intact this time of year. Um, they're broader and they come down and they have a lobe and then they go up to the petiole. It's what's known as the sinus, you know, like an earlobe. Um, whereas Magnolia tripetal, the flowers taper at both ends. So they're, they're narrow, they get wider, and then they narrow down to the stem. They don't have the big ears. The ears, you know, if this is, if this stem of, is the leaf stalk, the, the um, leaves of Magnolia macrophylla come down and then go back up to the petiole, whereas tripetal or taper all right it to, into the stem. And um, tripetal of flowers smell bad, or smell bad to my nose, and these smell good. Um, yeah. Will you talk a little about propagation of this plant? Um, Magnolia macrophylla is almost always grown from seed. Um, you know, a single specimen like this might not make much viable seed. If you had multiple plants, I'm sure you, they would send viable seed. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it could be propagated by grafting or something like that. Um, there are a couple selections. You know, the typical magnolia macrophylla leaf is somewhere between 18 and 24 inches long, but there are some individuals with much longer leaves. And, People might propagate those by probably grafting, not rooting. Magnolia tamalipana is the Mexican counterpart to our native Magnolia grandiflora. See, it looks quite a bit like it. Um, though I, I've seen a number of individuals of this Mexican species, and the leaves are kind of a dull green, where I, I think. Our typical Magnolia grandiflora has some of the prettiest evergreen foliage, real glossy green and often with a rusty underside, but um, Tamalipas is, or Tamalipana um, is its Mexican counterpart. I think that's all we have time for today, and I think we might have run out of magnolias. <laughs> um, well, at least ones that are blooming now, there'll be a lot more later on this spring. I thank everybody for coming out. Thank you, Doug. Sure.